Why is it that the information around hyperbaric oxygen is still so conflicted? Well, quite honestly, there's a lot of challenges in hyperbaric research, and that's what we're gonna cover in today's video. So if you've been involved in hyperbarics for any length of time, you know that there's a lot of conflicting information and even conflicting research inside of the hyperbaric industry. So quite honestly, I believe that one of the biggest issues in the research, and not just in hyperbarics, but just in the research realm overall, is the way we read research. Even well-educated practitioners typically have a very limited view on how they look at the research, which sections of the research they read, and really which sections of the research that they understand. A lot of people reading research, whether it's lay people or practitioners, begin and end in the abstract alone. You know, the initial paragraph of the research that might describe why they did the research, what was involved, and maybe a sentence or two about the results. If you're a little bit more advanced, maybe you read the abstract and the entire results and conclusion section. So you read the summary, and if that's interesting to you, you actually look at the end and understand the conclusion and the results. Very few people actually take the time to read the entire research study to really understand what was the methods, what was the research design. Is this research design even appropriate to assess whatever outcome somebody was looking for? Very few people look at the end of the research to see who funded the research, because as unfortunately many of us know, even well-meaning research may be swayed one way or another based on who funded that research. So I start this video on that just to say, please, if you're looking into the research, read the abstract, read the results, but read everything in between. Understand the methods, understand the design. If you're not familiar with methods and design of research, become familiar. Because if you're trying to really get the answers to whether or not a certain research project was effective, we really need to understand the entire process and to read these papers with a critical eye. The next topic, which is really the most critical topic, is the design of hyperbaric research. There's a few foundational issues. Number one, this is not a single ingredient that we're delivering to somebody to have a singular response. In other words, in the pharmaceutical industry, we may create a pill that has a very specific ingredient and then we're measuring what specific biochemical response that these people have. In an attempt to evaluate what individual effect that this individual ingredient had while we controlled as many of the other variables as possible, we had to create a very specific lens of research to be able to view that. And so we've created the double-blind, randomized, controlled crossover study as the gold standard in research so that we can evaluate the effects of this type of research. Now, hyperbaric might be a single ingredient like oxygen, but there's actually an additional pressure. And so pressure may have an effect independent of oxygen alone. And even inside the oxygen conversation, there's the amount of O2 somebody is getting, but there's also the amount of oxidative stress somebody is getting. If they're breathing any air, they're getting nitrogen. And so there might be some reactive nitrogen along with the reactive oxygen. And so we're really not even assessing a single ingredient. In addition to that, virtually every cell inside of our body, other than the red blood cells that carry oxygen, utilize oxygen as their way of creating ATP or cellular energy. And so as a result of adding this ingredient into a person's body, you have to have a systemic effect. You can't just put hyperbaric in somebody's elbow or hyperbaric in somebody's foot. This is something we breathe in. The oxygen is literally systemic. It starts to have a very broad cellular impact pretty quickly. As a result, it really doesn't line up with the standard that the drug industry has created as far as research design goes. However, because that's the gold standard in research, we still have to figure out ways to try and fit hyperbaric into these guidelines and so that we do the best we can. With any research, you have a treatment group. Here's a group of people that are getting hyperbaric oxygen in this case. And maybe we have a few treatment groups because they're getting different percentages of oxygen or different pressure. So here's a 1.5, 100% oxygen. Here's a 2.0, 100% oxygen, right? There are different groups getting different pressures and we want to see what their effects are. But in order to really understand what their effects are, we had to have a control group. The control group doesn't get any treatment at all. Because over the course of a month or two months or three, however long this treatment period is, we have to make sure that the control group, which got no therapy at all, should result in no changes by the end of the research. If the treatment groups had certain changes, but the control group had very similar or equal changes, then we can't account that that treatment was the cause of those benefits. Likewise, a good study would also have a sham. A sham is a fake treatment. So these people think they got treated, but they didn't get treated. And this helps us eliminate some of the placebo effect. With a medication, maybe they take a pill, it's the same size, the same shape, the same color, the same flavor. Everything is the same except there's no active ingredient. Whereas the treatment groups are getting the active ingredient. 
In hyperbaric, it's very difficult to create a sham. It's not impossible, but it's difficult because people know if they're in the chamber or not. And if you don't get the pressure in your ears, then you know if it was pressurized or not. And so creating a valid sham is very difficult in this industry. With a little bit of thought, you could create a very meaningful sham in hyperbarics, and I'll give you some examples of that. But there have been quite a few studies in the past that have used potentially therapeutic doses of hyperbaric as a sham. In other words, here was a group that got 100% oxygen at 2.0, and here is the sham group, the fake treatment group. They got 1.3 air only. And so what they're saying is that's a fake treatment. That doesn't count but the 2.0 at 100% does, and then the control group got nothing. And now we can compare the effect of all three of these groups of people. Now, whether that design was on purpose to skew some of the results, or whether that design was out of ignorance, not realizing that 1.3 on air could be therapeutic, either way, it has shifted the results section of many studies in past hyperbaric research. In fact, there are quite a few studies that if you look at the actual results, they'll say, due to the fact that there was not a statistically significant difference between the sham group and the treatment group, we cannot recommend hyperbaric for X, Y, or Z. When in fact, if you really looked at the data sets, you'll see that the control should have had no impact at all, but perhaps the sham improved and the treatment group improved, but there was no statistical difference between those two. Therefore, hyperbaric could not have been the cause of those improvements. You see what the problem was, was that the sham group was actually a treatment and the treatment group was also a treatment. And therefore there was no statistical difference between those two. However, in reality, hyperbaric helped both of those groups. We'll get right back to that video, but real quick, if you're a practitioner or you're looking to get into hyperbarics and you're wanting to learn more and making sure that you're offering this therapy as effectively and as safely as possible, I want you to know that we offer a series of courses, some of which are online and some of which are in person. At thehbotcourse.com, we'll include a link below. We have several courses available from training and certification in hyperbaric medicine, safety director, as well as a few different business implementation options to get the business up and running. So if you think that training and education would be helpful for you, take a look at thehbotcourse.com. Again, the link will be in the description below. Now back to our video. There are a number of research projects that had similar design which ultimately really skews the results. So if you read the abstract, it might've said, we assessed hyperbaric oxygen to see if hyperbaric may affect this, that, or the other condition. And then if you read the results, it says, well, because the sham group and the treatment group did not have a statistical difference in terms of their impact, hyperbaric is not indicated in this particular condition. Whereas if the design was a little different and the sham was actually considered a treatment group, it would have said something like, we did this research to assess whether or not hyperbaric oxygen is helpful for X, Y, or Z condition. We did the minimum effective dose of hyperbaric, which is 1.3 air only. We did a higher dose of oxygen, which is maybe 1.75 or 2.0 on 100% oxygen. And then the results would have said something like, well, because there was not a statistical difference between the lower pressure group and the higher pressure group, and because both groups improved, we recommend the lower pressure group as a treatment because that's the minimum effective dose for helping a person with X, Y, or Z condition but it's because of the design itself that it creates the results that say hyperbaric is not good for this condition. This is why I started this conversation by saying, please understand how to evaluate research design and research methods so that you can look at these things with a critical eye and actually understand whether or not the design of the research was appropriate for the results that they're claiming to have. There have been a few studies in TBI and concussion specifically that suffer from this research design. There was also a landmark study on CP that suffers from this research design. And I'll include the links in the description below so that you could evaluate some of this information and see for yourself exactly what I'm talking about with regard to research design and results that have to mimic what the design actually told them. If you wanted to have a good sham, and there are some out there, What you would need to do is you would need to pressurize the chamber and then depressurize the chamber in a way that that patient experiences all the same pressure changes that a patient would who's actually getting treated. And so you seal the door, you start to pressurize the chamber, they get some ear changes. At the same time, you're depressurizing the chamber, they're continuing to get those ear changes, and then you hold it at a below 1.1 pressure for the remainder of that session that should create a false treatment without any therapeutic value that we could actually consider to be a sham. 
And there have been more recent studies utilizing the sham as part of their research design and doing a sham much more similar to what I'm describing here. Amongst a number of other reasons, this is actually one of the reasons that I decided to do my own research comparing 1.3 versus 2.0 as one way to even open the conversation about, well, what does 1.3 do and what does 2.0 do and how do they compare to one another? This is really the first comparative study that I've seen looking at mild versus high pressure analysis. So we did do a double blind placebo control. We did not have a sham, but we did use the crossover. In other words, we had a double blind. We didn't know who was in each group. They didn't know who was in each group. We had two different treatment groups, a lower pressure and a higher pressure and a control. The treatment groups went through their treatment. Neither group knew which they were in, high or low pressure. And the control group got measured before and after to make sure that there were no benefits inside the control group that may have led to false benefits that the two treatment groups received. And then we did a crossover, meaning we took the control group, we broke them into half, and half got randomized into the mild group and half got randomized into the high pressure group so that they could go through the exact same treatment process and see if they had similar benefits as the original mild and high pressure groups did. We'll be doing a whole series of videos on the research that I completed last year with the results that we've been getting and what we're able to share at the moment. And that series is actually what's coming next over the next few weeks. So if you're interested to learn more about what this research showed in the comparison between lower pressure and higher pressure, make sure to subscribe and catch each video as they come out over the next subsequent weeks. I'm looking forward to sharing all of that information and we'll see you on the next video.